from Amy Lee, thank you so much uh, for that report. That is all in for this evening. The 11th hour with Brian Williams starts right now. Listen up. The breaking news started late today and never really stopped. Giuliani subpoenaed by Congress. Then came the Wall Street Journal reporting that our Secretary of State was on the call when Donald Trump asked the President of Ukraine for a favor. Then came the report from the New York Times that Trump pushed Australia's leader for help in an effort to hit back after the Mueller investigation at Attorney General Bill Barr's request. Then the Washington Post adds, the Attorney General has been traveling around the globe asking foreign intel officers to help his boss, Donald Trump. All of it against the background of an active impeachment inquiry. All of it as the 11th hour gets underway on a Monday night. It's a mess! Well, good evening once again from our NBC News headquarters here in New York. And what a back-to-work Monday this has been. It's a lot. The breaking news started late today, and it really has not stopped as we bring to a close day 984 of the Trump administration. And it turns out a phone call by the president had the power to do what the Russia investigation and the Mueller report failed to do, and that is to launch an official impeachment inquiry, a phone call. And the breaking news we are covering tonight has to do with that phone call between Donald Trump and the president of Ukraine when Trump pushed the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, to do him a favor and look into his likely Democratic rival, Joe Biden. Well, for starters, the Wall Street Journal reports and NBC News has since confirmed that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was on that call. He was among the officials listening in on the call of July 25, something not previously reported. The journal writes the revelation, quote, ties the State Department more closely to the House impeachment inquiry. Just last week, Pompeo was evasive when he was asked what he knew about that conversation. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that President Trump pressed the president of Ukraine eight times to work with Rudy Giuliani to investigate Joe Biden's son. What do you know about those conversations? So you just gave me a report about a, I think, whistleblower campaign, not, none of which I've seen. Are you confident that none of your staff, that you or none of your staff did anything improper in this whole uh, situation? To the best of my knowledge, and from what I've seen so far, uh, each of the actions that were undertaken by State Department officials was entirely appropriate. Also today, the president's globe-trotting personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, received a subpoena from the House Intelligence, Oversight, and Foreign Affairs Committee. Giuliani has been at the center of efforts to get Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden's family, and he's mentioned in the whistleblower's complaint multiple times. Democrats are asking for Giuliani documents, including text messages, phone records, other communications, and they want them by October 15. Tonight, Giuliani tells NBC News he hasn't decided whether he's going to comply. And in fact, just a short time ago, Giuliani was asked if he would ever agree to testify before Congress. I'm weighing the alternatives. I'm, I'll kind of like go through it. I'll get all my evidence together. I'll get my shards. I don't know if they let me uh, use videotapes and tape recordings that I have. If they let me uh, get some of the evidence that I gathered. I gathered all this evidence before the Mueller probe ended. So it was clearly under my responsibility as the lawyer for the President of the United States. Well, the New York Times reports that Trump pushed the Australian Prime Minister during another recent phone call to help his Attorney General Bill Barr gather information on the origins of the Mueller investigation into him. NBC News has also confirmed this story, although a Justice Department official calls Trump's request merely an ask. Times reporter Katie Benner is among the authors of this story. She'll join us in just a moment. She, along with her colleague Mark Mazzetti, write, quote, the White House curbed access to a transcript of the call which the president made at Mr. Barr's request to a small group of aides. Trump was, in effect, asking the Australian government to investigate itself. FBI counterintelligence investigators began examining any Trump ties to Russia's 2016 election interference after Australian officials told the Bureau that Russian intermediaries had made overtures to Trump advisors about releasing politically damaging information about Hillary Clinton. Then tonight came this. 
The Washington Post reporting that Attorney General Barr has been holding meetings overseas with foreign officials asking them to help in Trump's effort to investigate the Russia investigation. Big weekend for the president on Twitter, mostly airing his grievances about the Democrats' impeachment effort, wow. insisting, quote, I deserve to meet my accuser, the so-called whistleblower, and I want Schiff questioned at the highest level for fraud and treason. Then last night, he pushed out a quote from a guest on Fox News, if the Democrats are successful in removing the president from office, which they will never be, it will cause a civil war-like fracture in this nation from which our country will never heal. This afternoon, Trump continued to hammer the whistleblower and Chairman Schiff. That's almost like a threat. That's almost like... type of bribe. Maybe I use the wrong word. It wouldn't necessarily be a bribe. It would be more like a threat. He's telling everybody that if he goes, that means the sun's going to quit rising. and falling on the rest of the world and it basically means that the sky is going to fall and we as civilian citizens here in America will suffer the deepest dire consequences pertaining to a civil war. If there's ever been a time that we needed to pray for unity, clarity, and transparency, it is today. I thought that blackmailing people was against the law, that it was a crime. But maybe high-ranking officials can blackmail their citizens in a frightful scare tactic that they don't have to be held accountable for. I don't know. But this thing is coming unraveled quickly. Mr. President, do you now know who the whistleblower is, sir? Well, we're trying to find out about a whistleblower. When you have a whistleblower that reports things that were incorrect, the call was perfect. Uh, when the whistleblower reported it, he made it sound terrible. And then you had Adam Schiff, who, even worse, made up my words, which I think is just a horrible, I've never even think, seen a thing like that. Adam Schiff, representative, congressman, made up what I said. That prompted this response from the whistleblower's attorney, and we quote, the intel community whistleblower is entitled to anonymity. Law and policy support this, and the individual is not to be retaliated against. Doing so is a violation of federal law. We have a lot to get through, and four of our very best returning veterans to help us do that. Philip Rucker, Pulitzer Prize-winning White House Bureau Chief for The Washington Post. The aforementioned Katie Benner, Justice Department reporter for The New York Times. Barrett Berger, a former assistant U.S. attorney with both the Eastern District of New York and for good measure, the Southern District of New York, and Clint Watts, former FBI Special Agent, a Distinguished Research Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, the author of Messing with the Enemy, Surviving in a Social Media World of Hackers, Terrorists, Russians, and Fake News. Uh, good evening to you all. Uh, Katie, I'd like to begin with you and your reporting of uh, what this linked the Attorney General to um, I thought that there was a U.S. attorney from the state of Connecticut who had been appointed, in effect, the investigator of the investigators, going back to the origins of the Mueller uh, investigation. How deep into this investigation is the attorney general himself? 
I think that what we've seen with our reporting and with that great Washington Post report is that the Attorney General is not only extremely interested in this review, but that he is essentially quarterbacking it. You're right, he did ask John Durham, the U.S. Attorney in Connecticut, to oversee it, but truly it is Bill Barr who is, who is there every step of the way. The Justice Department would argue that he needs to be, in part because this review involves so many high-level uh, foreign officials, and that it's, it's Bill Barr who would appropriately try to get their cooperation. But also, I think you could argue that he's truly interested in this. You know, he said before uh, Congress earlier this spring that he believes that spying did occur on the campaign. He wants to know whether or not it was unlawful, and he, do, he himself personally wants to get to the bottom of this. Phil Rucker, let's talk about our Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo. Yeah. Um, and it probably bears repeating, this is not a fly-by-night individual. Here's a guy who graduated number one in his class at West Point and went to Harvard Law School. Uh, he knows from what is proper, and he knows better, uh, in lack of a better phrase. Um, how damaging is this news? He was on that call. Well, Brian, it's a, it's a really surprising uh, revelation today that he was on that call, and I think it shows a few things. And, and in terms of damaging, by the way, it's very problematic for Secretary Pompeo himself because he now becomes ensnared in this impeachment investigation. But what it tells us about the administration is that what Trump was doing with Ukraine uh, was supervised in a way by the Secretary of State and that the Secretary of State did not uh, apparently register any alarm about it and in fact was questioned as you showed in the opening uh, of the show uh, by reporters and did not seem to offer the full truth in his answers. You might even say uh, he was covering something up in his answers. And we're learning more and more about the role of the State Department in this whole Ukraine episode because Rudy Giuliani is talking about how he's been coordinating uh, some of his his, his work with Ukraine, his conversations with Ukraine through the State Department, and it begs the question of whether the State Department, which is supposed to be conducting foreign policy on behalf of the nation, is instead focused on the president's sort of personal political interests in doing the president's bidding uh, when it comes to the investigation of Joe Biden that Trump uh, has so wanted. Clint, this was another good day for journalism and for journalists. When you read this portrait of our Attorney General, talking with intel folks overseas about intel folks on the home team that's not a great look is it if you want to be an isolated country with no allies and not see what's coming this is the way to handle your business how confusing would it be for any other country around the world right now to have an attorney general come to you when you're normally dealing with the cia or envoys or the dni in terms of international intelligence in terms of sharing information it has to be baffling to them. And there is a complete erosion of trust, whether it's Australia we've talked about today, Ukraine, all of our Five Eyes partners, Germany, the UK, they all maybe helped or supplied information during the Mueller report and the Mueller investigation. What is the purpose of this? And what really is shocking is the government seems to be run by basically three people, Pompeo, Barr, and Giuliani, who I can't figure out is even part of the government. or Without portfolio. Without portfolio. So it's very confusing, I think, to anybody that's ever interacted with the U.S. government before from overseas to understand who is in charge, who they're supposed to listen to. And remember, on the ground, we have State Department uh, folks, we have Department of Defense, we have intel agencies, we've got defense and state contractors, development aid. They all are in different reporting chains. It seems as if no one really knows what the other part of this government is doing and why the Attorney General isn't back home enforcing laws, instead running around the world coordinating intelligence activities or investigating intelligence activities. It's chaotic. It's chaos. And it says in the Bible that Satan is the author of confusion. This is all confusion. It's become complex, chaotic. And it's gotten worse, and it could, and it could very well become very dangerous if they don't watch because some people take people at their word and whenever somebody tells somebody something and then they find out that it's a ball-faced lie then is whenever you upset the apple cart. <clears throat> Barrett Berger, why is it not witness intimidation to hear the president talk about the whistleblower and remind the folks watching tonight the protections 
whistleblowers have under the law. Yeah, I mean, I think it actually is witness intimidation. I mean, that is the whole reason that we have these type of whistleblower protections, because it takes a tremendous amount of courage to come forward to, re to report some sort of misconduct or criminality, but it also takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of faith in the system that you will have laws that will protect you, exactly. that you won't be retaliated against, that you won't have the President of the United States actively trying to reveal who you are. I mean, if you think about it, given sort of the vitriol that the President has expressed so publicly about what the whistleblower has done, if this person, if this person is outed... Or put the, out a bounty on you. This person would certainly have a bounty on their head. So I think we can't overstate sort of the danger of the president making these statements, trying to out this person. Right. Well, Phil Rucker, um, the president seems preoccupied with the whistleblower and Chairman Schiff, among other things. Yeah. Is this, again, the absence of an overarching strategy? Well, the overarching strategy at the moment, Brian, is whatever President Trump is thinking in the given hour. There does not seem to be a grand strategy, either from a legal perspective or a public relations perspective, to get him out of this hole and to protect the presidency. And so what he's doing, uh, and we saw this throughout the weekend, is he's lashing out. He's trying to discredit the whistleblower. He's trying to discredit Chairman Schiff. It's notable, by the way, that he's going after Schiff much more intensively than he is going after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who's the one last Tuesday who launched these impeachment proceedings. They, the, there's a calculation in the White House that Schiff is a more vulnerable target. But the other thing Trump is trying to do is project this narrative that he is somehow being unfairly persecuted, that he's the greatest victim in the history of victims. Uh, no president's been treated this way throughout American history, as he claims on Twitter. And, and he feels this sense of self-pity that he's broadcasting to the world. Uh, and that is significant and it's different. We've not seen that before with other presidents who've been uh, staring down impeachment. Katie Benner, can you remind our viewers of the kinds of professionals inside DOJ, forgive me, I have this respiratory thing that uh, half of New York seems to have, uh, excuse me, the kinds of professionals who reside inside DOJ who would take a dim view of Rudy Giuliani's travels as a de facto kind of hovering attorney general or the actual attorney general's travels on behalf of his boss. Sure, taking Giuliani first, I think that both professionals inside of the Justice Department and the State Department would take not only a dim view of what Rudy Giuliani has done, but they would say that it actively hurts them and it makes it harder for them to do their jobs because they also have to interface with foreign leaders, foreign officials, and other law enforcement people. And not knowing what Rudy Giuliani is saying makes it very difficult for them to have credibility and also so they can get caught flat-footed. With regard to Barr, it's very interesting because the Attorney General is trying very hard to make the case that everything he is doing is within the letter of the law and that he is doing it for a valid reason. He wants to know if people acted unlawfully in 2016. And while he makes that claim, it's interesting, I'm starting to hear more and more from career professionals inside of the Justice Department, that they don't understand why so much time and energy is being devoted to a review for which we already have one other investigations looking at. So we have an Inspector General investigation that should be completed soon, we hope, that should give us some insight into what happened in 2016. And then we, of course, have the Mueller report, which was a very full account of what happened in 2016. So I think people are, one, confused about the Durham Review in general, and two, very surprised to see the Attorney General taking such a firm interest and being so active in it. Clint Watts, um, you are a U.S. Military Academy graduate and a former Fed and a patriot. So when the president says what he said, casually invoking a civil war in the United States, how does that strike you? I thought it was America first and it was supposed to be about all Americans, and it really seems to be only about certain Americans. And it's bizarre to me that the president whose job is the commander-in-chief, is also the unifier-in-chief of the country. He's supposed to set out a vision for the exactly. country to mobilize and do the best for as many Americans as possible. Exactly. That is the inverse uh, of what I was taught as leadership when I went to West Point, whether it was serving in the Army, the FBI, or other roles in government. I don't understand why he attacks people of his own executive branch. Uh, someone needs to remind him that the FBI is part of his, his org, Right. Uh, the CIA is part of his organization. Right. All of these outfits are part of his organization. And the way to lead them is not by tearing them apart, 
by not going off the, after FBI agents for doing their job or right. after intel officials for doing their job, but instead give them a vision of what you want them to achieve and how you want to achieve it. And I've never heard that in the two and a half years that President Trump has been in charge of this country. And finally, to Barrett Berger, do you think Rudy Giuliani is a walking gold mine of information now tonight? He's just fluttering out the, the notion that he may have recordings or video, uh, cinematographer style, um, that we didn't know about. But also, what is the consequence if he says no to cooperating? Yeah, I mean, you can see why Congress started with him. He absolutely, as you said, he is this treasure trove of information and evidence. I mean, every time he sort of pointed to his phone and was like, there's so much evidence in my phone, you know, so many of the former prosecutors were all like, so get the phone, yeah. subpoena you know, the phone. Um, but to his comments about, you know, he's weighing his options with respect to this, we keep saying this, but you know, subpoenas aren't voluntary. These are compulsory. And he may have some, you know, privilege issues that he wants to float around. I don't know how effective those were going to be. I mean, you know, just having a lawyer involved in a conversation doesn't necessarily make a communication privileged, right? I mean, every conversation that you and I have had is not privileged. Well, because, they've been watching the whole time. Right, yeah. exactly. So it's not confidential. It's not seeking legal advice. So I think there's going to be a lot of questions raised about you know, what was Giuliani's role with respect to the president? What type of legal advice uh, was the president seeking? What was the nature of their conversation? If this is really the president you know, directing Giuliani to take certain actions on his behalf, I'm not sure that's going to qualify as sort of typical legal advice that would potentially protect it from exactly. uh, having to be disclosed to Congress. So I don't know that he's going to have a successful defense against having to comply exactly. with the subpoena, which does not mean he won't try. As we said at the outset of tonight, it's a lot. We are much obliged to our front four for helping us get through it all. Phil Rucker, Katie Benner, Barrett Berger, Clint Watts, our thanks. Coming up, there's been a big change just in the past few days. It has to do with public opinion on the topic of impeachment. And later, the man who says he knew it was a bad idea before Trump even got on the phone with the Ukrainian president. Oh, and by the way, he doesn't work for our president anymore. The 11th hour just getting started on this Monday night. Reverse early go the world. Exclusive This week, House Democrats plan to get depositions from key State Department officials mentioned in that whistleblower complaint. Wednesday, they'll hear from a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine who was ousted from her post. Thursday, the ex-special envoy Kurt Volker will be questioned. Friday is the deadline for Pompeo to respond to a subpoena. And it is also when the House Intel Committee will hear from Intel Community Inspector General Michael Atkinson about the handling of the whistleblower's complaint. As we said, it's a lot. The Senate is watching to see what happens, no surprise. Today, Majority Leader McConnell was asked how he will respond if the House votes to impeach the president. If the House does uh, go down that path, and we'll follow the Senate rule, I would have no choice but to take it up. Still with us, we've asked our, our print colleagues, Philip Rucker and Katie Benner, to hang around for one more round of questioning. Phil, let's talk about the Democrats in the House. Every minute we're, we're watching and listening to Schiff, we're not watching or listening to Nadler, who happens to chair the Judiciary Committee, famously, when that committee had their moment of moral high ground, snubbed by the Attorney General, they answered with an empty chair for emphasis and a bucket of chicken, uh, which kind of ruined the moment. Do you think there is some strategy behind Pelosi's assignment? There seems to be, Brian. I mean, part of the reason for the assignment is that the, this issue of the Ukraine call and the whistleblower complaint seems to fall squarely uh, in, in the lap of, of the House Intelligence Committee. So it's only natural, uh, therefore, that Chairman Schiff would be taking the lead on this. But I think Pelosi is also expressing real confidence in Chairman Schiff to be able to handle this uh, delicately and, as she put it, expeditiously. Uh, one of the things that's been so breathtaking in the last week is this 
speed with which Democrats have gotten these proceedings off the ground uh, and, and planned, uh, planned these events of the week that you just laid out. I mean, this is moving very fast. Uh, and, and I think it's surprising some people who are watching because Congress, as you know, does not usually move this fast. Uh, Katie, we're not used to our Attorney General uh, doing that much overseas travel. It's generally considered a domestic job. This AG is back from the UK and Italy. No comment on the travels. And I guess my question is because of your reporting and what else is out there, I, are we going to now view all of his actions travels and movements through this prism of how much of it is devoted to this investigation. Yeah, I think that even if we weren't aware of his overseas travels, because he is taking such a hand in this investigation, because he has already said that he believes that spying was conducted against the Trump campaign and he has questions about whether or not it was done incorrectly, I think that it would be impossible to not view the Attorney General through the lens of this investigation, or this, sorry, as they would put it, review into why the intelligence community chose to look into the Trump campaign. One of the issues for the Justice Department and for Bill Barr is that these two things, this review that John Durham is doing, and the work that Rudy Giuliani has been doing, especially his attempts to get dirt on, dirt as he would put it, on Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, these things have become conflated in the president's mind, which is what we see in the Ukraine phone call. And so for the Justice Department, they're going to have to distance themselves from that in order to continue to say that what they're doing is legitimate. Of course, for the Democrats who Phil says, you know, very correctly, are moving extremely fast, they are going to grab at anything that they can use to ask more questions and gather more information, it's inevitable that they start to look at the Attorney General. As I said, it was another proud day for journalism and journalists. Uh, two of the best uh, hanging out with us tonight. Katie Benner, Phil Rucker, thank you so much for taking our questions and coming up. All the President's Men, a deeper look at who was reportedly listening to the call with the Ukrainian President and who wasn't when we come back. the judge. It Former National Security Advisor, now out of a job, that John Bolton, knew it was a bad idea even before Trump called the new president of Ukraine. Our own Carol Lee shares a byline on this report that reads in part, quote, three officials said Bolton argued against Trump calling Ukrainian President Zelensky on July 25 because he was concerned the president wasn't coordinating with advisors on what to say and might air personal grievances. Now there is growing and understandable fear that Bolton and his allies who are out there in the world talking might inflict damage on this president after they've exited, quote, they know where a lot of the bodies are buried, one person close to the White House said. Officials also said Bolton was among senior officials, including Mike Pence, who did not listen in on the call. For more, I am joined by the aforementioned Carol Lee, an NBC News correspondent. Hey, Carol, why did Bolton know so well to oppose the call? And is what we're seeing here kind of that conditional courage where former Trump people speak out a little bit about the Trump administration in the rearview mirror? Well, what we know about what was happening at that time, which Ambassador Bolton would have been aware of, keenly aware of, was that there was this uh, effort by the president to hold up the, the military aid for Ukraine, um, and there was concern among people in the White House and elsewhere that that was somehow, that the president was tying that to uh, what he wanted the Ukrainian government to do in terms of investigating the former Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter. And so Bolton would have, would have been aware of that, obviously. Um, and it was, it was, and so, you know, that you can't separate that from the fact that he was concerned uh, about the president making this call. Um, and so, so now, you know, we've seen today, we've learned things, we've learned something new about each of these individuals, whether it's John Bolton or Rudy Giuliani or Bill Barr or Mike Pompeo. And when you look at the four of them, the only one of them is not, no longer in the government. And that has a lot of people worried um, around the president 
because John Bolton was someone who left on very contentious terms, and he's well known in Washington as somebody who likes a good fight and doesn't really back down, and he's already shown that he's willing to speak out um, and confront uh, and disagree with the president and be a little more combative than other top national security officials who've, who've left the White House. But, you know, in terms of whether this is because he's gone, a little bit of that for sure, but also he was already talking, you know, out of uh, disagreeing with President President Trump while he was in office, sometimes publicly, and that's part of the reason why their relationship deteriorated so much. And now it looks like the gloves is fixing to come off and there's sure enough going to be a boxing match, politically speaking. Um, any names come to mind? Who else might have cause tonight to be nervous about being sucked into this whole larger case? Well, I think there are a number of officials who, there's there's sort of two different strands of people being nervous. There are pe people who are nervous about being sucked into this and having to lawyer up and, and face potential subpoenas, certainly in the State Department um, and elsewhere. And then there's people who, you know, there's obviously White House officials who told the whistleblower um, about certain sequences of events and so there's very there's people who are worried because the president is out there you know tarnishing the reputation and putting uh, potentially the whistleblower in danger and so there's a real concern there's a real the search for who's talking, what are they saying, um, and, and that has a lot of people very nervous and, and it's making it somewhat difficult to try to get people to talk to you. Or as they call it in Washington, D.C., Monday. Uh, Carol Lee, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on tonight. Sure, uh, thanks, and thanks, thank you for talking about your, uh, your story. We will continue to look for your byline as we always do. Coming up, our next guest says Donald Trump can't win re-election, but the Democrats sure can lose it. Are you facing... So over the weekend, some of the president's Republican allies in Congress, there are many, wasted no time defending him as pressure builds now over this impeachment inquiry. I think this whole thing is a sham. I can't believe we're talking about impeaching the president based on an accusation based on hearsay. Look, if Democrats want to impeach because uh, Rudy Giuliani talked to a couple of Ukrainians, good luck with that. What do you make of this exchange? President Zelensky says we are almost ready to buy more javelins from the United States for defense purposes. And President Trump replies, I would like you to do us a favor, though. Well, you just added another word. No. It's you said, I'd like transcript. you to do a favor, though? Yes, it's in the, it's in <laughs> when the I read White the House transcript. transcript. When... So that's kind of how that went. And with us for more tonight is Rick Wilson, longtime Florida man, longtime Republican strategist, who is soon following up on his first book, Everything Trump Touches Dies, with a new work, Running Against the Devil, which is due out in early 2020. It is a thrill to have you, as always. Thank you, sir. So tonight, I am reminded, Sean Spicer... Uh, dance to Saturday Night Fever mm -hmm. on Dancing with the Stars. And Sebastian Gorka is on board a U.S. government plane with our Secretary of State going to Europe. Um, we saw that selection of, uh, of Trump allies. There's a whole population of people in Washington who think this might be ballgame here. There are a lot of very nervous folks right now, and they're thinking that you know, they, they've tried to hide in the tall grass for a long time. They play the MAGA game when they have to, and they quietly whisper to reporters, I am really concerned. My brow is furrowed. I'm, I'm deeply, deeply troubled. And they understand that there's a point where you can't just keep pretending. And we're rapidly reaching the point where you can't just keep pretending. And, you know, what was Bill Barr doing in Italy? Why are they making these phone calls to Australia? We want more of the details about Ukraine. You know, I know Seb Gork is probably in Europe pitching fish oil tablets or whatever it is he does for a living now. But these guys are all of a piece. They are, they are this, this flotsam around Trump. So many that were involved in this. And I hope they're all tonight pondering second mortgages so they can lawyer up. Can you imagine what it feels like for the Aussies? As a, a lover and appreciator of yep. history, there we were side by side on the beaches of Normandy. <laughs> right. What do we want from them now? A little information. Yep. So, yeah, help us, help us blackmail a competitor in a, in a political election in the U.S., they're in trying to extort foreign powers 
by using the awesome majesty of the president's office and the powers of the United States government, trying to extort, it's just, it's the lowest level thug behavior. Um, I have a dramatic reading from the Twitter account of Jonathan Martin with the New York Times. It's about politics and your political party. The squeeze is on Republicans left in high income congressional districts and states. Here is college plus whites. I just love how demographers instantly reduce entire groups of Americans. 46% already for impeach and remove, 52% for the inquiry, 57% believe Trump thinks he's above the law, just 1% fewer believe he abuses the power of his office, 51% believe he's committed crimes as president. So you start thinking, wow, the Republicans should be very nervous. Then I look at Rick Wilson. Donald Trump can't win re-election, but the Democrats can certainly lose it. It's an old problem. Explain. The Democrats have a great gift for snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, unless they have generational candidates who, are, who, are, who have phenomenal skills. They had two in our lifetime. They had Barack Obama and they had Bill Clinton, who were both naturally gifted political figures. They understand how to connect with people. They have charisma for days. None of the current field reaches that level of performance. And I think that the danger that I've seen coming at the, at the Democratic Party for a long time now is a lot of them still believe that this is going to be a referendum about policy. This election is a referendum, as all presidential elections are, about Trump. They are all referendum, all, all the referendum thought in this election is going to be Trump or not Trump. X future or Y future. If the future you want is Trump's kicking you in the face until all eternity, well then re-elect Donald Trump. If you want to argue about policy, you're re-electing Donald Trump. It's, you've got, I mean, and, and Trump hands them right now the opportunity to go after him as a man who is corrupt, who is ineffective, and who, is, who has led this country into a place where the reputation of our president is as, a, is as an extortionist and a mercenary. When our president tosses out a reference to a civil war? Right. Right. I think that that is, again, this is a way to make a referendum on this man. What kind of president in this country... You know, other than the guy, unless he's got Jefferson Davis fantasies, wants to go out and have their reputation be, you know, retweeting and praising somebody who, who's threatening a civil war. If he doesn't get to, to operate above the law, if he doesn't get to be unaccountable in every way. The sky's going to fall. This is the kind of thing that Trumpism has normalized in our country, and it's a great danger, Brian. Uh, Jeff Flake, consensus Hall of Fame, furrowed brow Hall of Fame member, Concern face Hall of Fame member says to his fellow Republicans, uh, you know, uh, it's, there's still time to save your souls. Others remember Flake as the guy who saved Kavanaugh right before skipping town. Um, not the best guy to make that argument? Look, I would prefer, and there will be a tremendous first mover advantage for some seated member of the U.S. Senate right now to make that point and to recognize that Donald Trump will drag every single one of them under and they will all drown and die politically if they don't start breaking away. This is the problem that 1973 and 74 taught us. In 1973, the Republicans were lockstep on Nixon. If you go back, it was all, it's a media conspiracy against the president. It's liberal elites against the president. Well. In 1974, the voters of the United States decided that, 54, or that 49 Republicans needed to go home forever, and that eight members of the Republican Senate needed to go home forever. Forever. This is a political consequence of a corrupt president who abuses power. Right now, Donald Trump, and the thing about Nixon, Nixon was not about money. Nixon was not about personal gain. Nixon was in the game because that was his character. Trump is venal. Trump wants political power so he can continue to enrich himself and his family. And this is a category above even Richard Nixon, and that takes a lot of doing. Rick Wilson, wow. well, thank you so much. It's yes, sir. a pleasure, pleasure. to thank have you. you on our broadcast. And coming up, our next guest literally wrote the book on leadership in turbulent times. Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Doris Kearns Goodwin is here and with us next when we continue. Of a sitting member of Congress, more than that, a committee chair. Thankfully, I cannot remember when the last time was. I mean, the words that are thrown around, I mean, this is really important right now as we go through this impeachment process. 
We have to define what treason is. We have to define what the rule of law is. What is abuse of power? What is violating the office? You can't just throw words. Either side can't throw words around without explaining it. That's what the country needs so that public sentiment can coalesce if they think that impeachment is necessary to create a consensus. That's what has to be done so the country will not have a civil war fracture like the president predicted. Well, that's what I was going to ask about next. You, you wrote with such beauty and clarity about the civil war. Can you believe that our president has casually mentioned that, among other topics, over the weekend? I mean, when you think about what that civil war meant to this country, splitting apart literally more than 600,000 soldiers dying because the North and the South could not deal with slavery in the same way, and that somebody might predict that if we go ahead with the impeachment, there might be a civil war fracture in the country. I mean, it's the last thing you want from a president who's hopefully going to be the president of all the people to be able to heal the country. You know, at least during the Nixon impeachment, by the end of it, when Gerald Ford stood up, and he said, our long national nightmare is over. We are a government of laws, not a government of men. There was a healing process because the way it was dealt with. And then we've got to hope somehow by the end of this that there's a consensus, if the impeachment goes through, that it was the right thing to do. Well, following that very crisis, your fellow author, Carl Bernstein, has always said Republicans were the heroes of Watergate. Do you see it possible that the same dynamic could emerge in our time? I think the question right now, when you think about the Nixon impeachment, was that at the beginning only 19% thought he should be impeached, and then gradually that number increased as events overshadowed what was happening. At first Nixon was saying, I had nothing to do with it, I don't know the plumbers, but then you finally have the events. You have the John Dean testimony. You have the, um, the, the people inside the administration being sent, as we, as we know, with Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Mitchell into indictments. And then you have, of course, the tapes. I mean, the tapes were the smoking gun. And by that time, Republicans had to respond to events. So the question will be, how will these hearings educate the country? How will they make the country understand, if this person is above the law, that what that means? Um, Doris Kearns Goodwin has agreed to stay with us over this break. Um, a big question for her on the other side of this break when we come back. Sleep number 360 smart bed. You can adjust your comfort on both sides. Your sleep number setting. Can it help us fall asleep faster? Yes. Smart bed. You can adjust your comfort on... It is really, really sad in how corruption can wedge out the ones that was gullible towards taking the bait and becoming corrupt versus those that was not. And whenever you have a system that is plagued with so many, so many corrupt individuals, naturally this is what's going to occur similar towards what went on during the collapse of one of the greatest governments in the world pertaining to the old Roman government that basically deteriorated from the inside out. <clears throat> it's all about greed. And it's about selfishness. And it's about people not willing to put principle first and morals first. Because whenever these people get up there They're only thinking. Each one is thinking the same thing about himself. They're thinking about how can I benefit? How can I, my family benefit? What kind of book can I write to make all kinds of money off of? And it wasn't that way. Whenever our builders, our forefathers, rightfully went into office, and a lot of them was just as poor and just as broke, the day that they left office as they was before they ever went into office because they went in to office to serve the people. They didn't go into office to serve themselves. They went into office for the benefit of we the people. Today, looking at Dick Cheney, looking at the Bush family, looking at the 
the Clintons looking at other, even even the uh, Obamas. My God, they go in. They're only worth X amount of dollars, and whenever they come out, they're multimillionaires. So you can't tell me that that all of them isn't guilty of dibbling dabbling in the cookie jar and taking advantage of the American taxpaying people. It's sad that this is all now developing just within a short period of time, what, in the past three weeks, 21 days basically? This is all now, now starting to come out and we're really starting to see the true colors of who our chief and commander is and how he interacts towards different things that's being said and done. Kind of like Ju Rudy Giuliani. A lot of times Rudy Giuliani, as far as I'm concerned, would be a lot better off if he just kept his mouth shut. Because he keeps saying stuff that contradicts what he said five minutes before he said what he said. In other words, he's telling so many lies he don't know how to keep up by covering up the lies. Sad. I have at least two Sad. more questions for you. The qualities in this book, which I sincerely hope everyone reads, of presidential leadership, what's your answer when you're asked about Trump's brand of presidential leadership? Well, just look at the qualities that my four guys that I studied, Lincoln, the two Roosevelt's, and LBJ on civil rights, they shared. Humility, empathy, resilience, the ability to create a team around them that could question their assumptions and argue with them, the sense of ambition for self being less than eventually the ambition for the world. I mean, those qualities are what we need in times of crisis. I mean, I'm always optimistic about America getting through in the sense that we've been through worse times before and somehow the citizens became active and we had the right leader in the right place at the right time. We had FDR, we had Teddy Roosevelt, we had Abraham Lincoln, we had LBJ in civil rights. The worrisome thing right now is what you and I were just talking about, which is we also had in those other times, not in the Civil War time, which we had a partisan press where you could have different facts and completely yeah. different discussions. We have now that kind of a partisan press where people are watching one cable network or another, facts are not in agreement. And does that mean that there'll be two different scenarios coming out of this impeachment hearing so that there's one set of facts and another and people don't agree in the end? That's why we need the kind of leadership that can somehow pull us together. Right. Well, that's a subset of my next and final question for you. Can that be put back? Is that like cutting off the arm of a starfish? Does that regrow? And more widely, what do you say when people ask, are we going to be okay? I say yes. I mean, I say that we've, as I say, that we've come through before, but it's going to require the kind of leader who emerges now that can somehow understand that the country has to pull together and have some consensus about the rule of law. I mean, that is the central thing right now. Lincoln worried so much during his, his young youth. His young youth, if that oh, makes sense, is, right? Is there any other kind? That if the rule of law was violated, that the answer to it was that you had to remind people of what the framers had fought for. People were forgetting the revolution because it had gone. So he said every night mothers should be reading to their kids about the revolution, about the ideals. They should be in the spelling book. They should be in the primers. We have to remember the ideals for the country and what it stood for. And if we can get back to that and we can have leaders who can get us back to that, somehow we'll get through this. Social media is a problem. The divided media is a problem. There's lots of problems. We've had, we went through a depression. We went through World War II. We went through the Civil War. If we got through those, as long as the citizens are active, as long as they take part in this, they educate themselves, and the leadership educates them, we'll be okay. History are, shows it. Are we ranking social media, it, giving it its importance as a multiplier of our troubles the way you think it'll be ranked by uh, historians 100 years in the future? To be sure it is now. The question is whether or not social media can also manage technologically to bring people together and to bring them to a common cause. We're not done with social media yet. We have to be able to figure out how to shape it. Right now, it's shaping us. Imagine if Lincoln had been looking down at his device instead of paying attention. Our thanks to our friend Doris Kearns Goodwin. The book is Leadership in Turbulent Times. And yes, these are. And that is our broadcast for this Monday evening as we start off a new week around here. Thank you so much for being here with us. Good night from our NBC News headquarters here in New York. I want to weigh in one more thing. You know, they brought up social media. 
Um, they was just announcing today on local news to where somebody had taken their own lives because of social bullying. And uh, whoever it was had a brother that thought enough of the brother that committed suicide that is going to take it to Washington to see what they can do about social media bullying. And that was one of the very reasons why that I made a conscious choice of getting off of Facebook was because Facebook is so interreacting with various people. I knew that if I was going to get my message out to the general public, I wasn't going to have time to listen to my critics. I wasn't going to have time to debate, uh, argue, uh, look at other people's uh, views because it was going to take up entirely too much of my time and to be quite honest with you you really don't accomplish anything by arguing or debating something um, you put your facts out there to the general public pertaining to uh, scriptures biblical Bible prophecy etc you put your ideals out there to the people of how you see things and how you feel about things and they make their own conscious decision about you regardless whether they support you they like you they think you're a whack job they think you're a liar they think you're hustling them they think you're just off your rocker you know the general public will be the ones ultimately that will make the the crucial decision about any individual just like Donald Trump it will be uh, the general public in a public setting that will basically persuade other people in how they feel and what they think about this particular president towards his actions how he responds just like this weekend putting out what they say over I don't forgot how many tweak he just went on a tweak storm uh, towards tweaking out all kinds of stuff um, people see through that People can see that, and they understand that he's becoming emotional, he's becoming unhinged, he's becoming uh, basically a loose screw in not being able to talk civilized and settling to the American people during these close encounters of investigations that's going on right now uh, pertaining to... Uh, the when, the how, the where, etc., etc. So, the commentary that was talking to the young lady there about social media. Social media, in ways, can be used as a very, very powerful tool. But social media can also be used as a weapon. And that's the defining part that not only the American people need to settle in their hearts and in their minds towards what they want to base their future off of for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, but the world. The world in general. Because this new animal that has been created. Right now, it's been unleashed to society. It's not harnessed. It's not tamed. Uh, you know, some of the stuff that I was picking up on Facebook, on social media, was just some of the most ungodliest stuff that I think that I've ever seen that social media, plat uh, Facebook platform, was allowing for it to go on. Um, hopefully we can fine-tune this monster and use it for the benefit and the glory of God versus the benefit of the devil. Good night and thank you to my viewers and good luck to all of us. Shalom. See ya.